Did you know October 11th is a national coming out day? What if one of your loved ones decides to come out on this very special day? Are you prepared to respond and react in a way that God wants you to? Let's talk about it. And I'm not going to do this alone. So we'll be right back. Hey friends, welcome back to Learn Together, uh, professional leadership conversations for the better church and healthy church. I am your host, Sehi Duran, and today we're going to have uh, some interesting conversation, very important conversation because the call is there to make disciples of all nations and all peoples, all nationalities and ethnicities. That includes our neighbors and friends, co-workers that are part of the LGBTQ plus community. See, I have a couple of friends that are like that in my circle of friendship, and I'm so blessed uh, to have those individuals in my life. But as a minister and as a friend, and sometimes I wish I knew better in how to engage them in a more meaningful way, not just um, just encourage them or I not just love them, but I just sometimes feel like I feel stuck. I want to know how to maximize this relationship to represent Christ well and ultimately lead them to Jesus for, for them to have eternal life and share this salvation together. Together. This is a hard topic. And, and October 11th is a national coming out day. I bet you somebody in your church is contemplating about coming out. And they're probably just praying a lot and, and just wrecking their just brain so hard because they just know how it, it's risky and they don't want to disappoint people that they love. Um, luckily, we have some amazing people who had walk this path and they are just so committed to Jesus right now and there are movers and shakers across uh, the denominations across the churches across church uh, and cultures and these two individuals actually uh, understand what it's like to be part of that community member and what it's also like to be on the other side of the church member to embrace them and love them and support them along the journey so i am very honored and thrilled to invite our two guests guys just get your notebook and a pen because you're going to be learning a lot and can i just uh, say this disclaimer and a lot of the churches and ministers we want to minister to the lgbtq plus community we just aren't sure where to get those kind of resources so here it is here's an opportunity so let me invite you um invite and introduce to you dr linda sailor and Reverend Joe Dallas. I am very thrilled to uh, just in, invite them to our conversation. Let me just introduce because their resume is so glowing. Dr. Linda Sailor is an ordained Assemblies of God minister and a national Chi Alpha field specialist in applied theology and culture, uh, applied theology and culture. There you go. And she's also the executive director for Restory Ministries. So we're going to learn about that a little bit more in, the, in a few moments. She learned about uh, uh, she earned a PhD from the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary in 2020 and with her dissertation investigating, get this, 30 cases and studies of men and women who were one same sex attracted and have experienced transformation. And she is one of them. Another one is Reverend Joe Dallas, an author, global conference speaker, an ordained pastoral counselor. He's a program director of Cloud Fire Ministry in Tustin, California, has authored nine books, maybe counting even, on human sexuality from a biblical perspective. He received his master's degree in Christian counseling from Vision University, San Diego, California, and is a member of the American Association of Christian Counselors. He's also the host of the weekly podcast called Christians in a Cancel Culture. Well, welcome, Dr. Linda and Joe. How are you doing? Thank very you. good. Thank you. Wow. I am very thrilled and um, just excited to have you on this podcast. And Linda, specifically, we wanted to have you on, on board a couple months ago, but you finished your uh, schooling and now uh, you're working and moving full force. And I'm going to just ask uh, questions back and forth, but uh, both of you, you guys feel free to chime in because I know that you both have some heavy and amazing insight that you want to speak into this topic. So let me just start with Dr. Seiler, okay? 
So you both are obviously are passionate about uh, this ministry because you've been there. This is not somebody else's story. This is your story. So tell us how Restory Ministries began and what kind of resources it offers to ministers, churches, and families uh, to walk alongside their loved ones who identify as uh, LGBTQ plus community. Dr. Seiler. Sure. Um, Restory Ministries started in the heart of Ginger Stahl. Uh, she, she used to be named Ginger Han when she had her, went, married her previous husband who passed away. And she um, was married to an AG pastor years ago, and he ended up uh, having an affair with another man. Uh, she found out, um, found a love letter uh, from his lover. It was all, you know, secret. She discovered this letter was heartbreaking. They eventually divorced and he um, eventually came down with AIDS. And Ginger is a noble woman of character. She ended up taking care of him until his dying days. Right. And um, then eventually her one of her sons came out as gay. And so she has experienced this topic both as a spouse, as a mother. And, um, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm getting any of these details wrong, but um, she really had a heart because of her personal experience to see uh, some kind of resource to equip Assemblies of God churches to address LGBTQ. Um, and so that was in her heart. Uh, and about seven years ago, uh, several of us who are from the Assemblies of God uh, were attending a conference called the Restored Hope Network uh, Conference. And Ginger was sharing her heart with other others of us from the Assemblies of God and said, you know, is it possible we could get together and do something to equip the Assembly? So we formally organized in around 2016 and uh, began brainstorming, what should we call this? Who should the board be? Constitution, bylaws, you know, all of those, you know, background stuff, becoming compliant with the IRS to become a 501c3, all those things you have to do. And, um, and are just now kind of getting underway. We've got the foundation laid, um, have a board in place, and just had a transition in leadership where I was voted in as executive director in June. And um, we're getting ready to have our first uh, conference in, well, we had our first conference in uh, September. Mm. And that was a conference to equip pastors, uh, lay leaders, concerned believers, family members on matters of LGBTQ. And what we offer as far as resources is on our website, um, we have a number of resource pages that books and videos we recommend, conferences we recommend, our own conference, obviously. From our conference, we're going to eventually release some training videos, recordings of the sessions at the conference. And those hopefully will be available in 2023. And in addition, right now, if you went onto our website, you could not only look at the books and resources we recommend, we have a YouTube channel with some free videos and all of that. We also have th something called quick guides, which are one page guides to help you respond to various topics related to LGBTQ. So for example, if somebody comes to you and says, I experienced same sex attractions, uh, what should I do? As a minister, how do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. um, or if you're an individual who experiences those attractions yourself, you know, what steps can I take and should I expect any change in my desires and what does that journey look like? So there's some mm -hmm. advice there or even hot topics like was the word homosexual added to the Bible? Is it a mistranslation? And so we address a number of hot topics and we're trying to release uh, quick guides on a, a fairly regular basis. Every one to two months, we're mm -hmm. putting out another quick guide on something that's pertinent to our culture. Mm -hmm. I hope you hold that conference more often, not just once a year. And this is like, because this is a daily lives of our congregate members, our neighbors, our coworkers. So to have it just once a year, it's just not enough, but it's a great start. And I'm so excited that you guys had a successful one. And even those trainings that you offer online, uh, it's a safe place where you can just go ahead and click and educate yourself. It's much better than just snap it out right and snap out of it like you can't just snap out of it uh it, it's a journey it, it's a daily journey and i read and and watched some videos on joe's testimony and how your journey had been up and down and just squiggly lines you thought you were on the right track and you kind of you know set a few back back steps and then go go again and so it is a complicated journey 
that you need someone to resource you with. Uh, and so prayer works, but you need more than just a prayer, right? So I rely on these resources. Uh, now, Joe, I have a question for you too. Um, as a seasoned writer and speaker, you get to travel. And, and on this timely topic, you know, this LGBTQ topic is not today's topic. It happened a decades conversation, really. Have you noticed any shift in how Christian leaders approach and interpret this topic in recent days that could be uh, maybe specifically concerning to you or maybe encouraging? Well, say, hey, one of my biggest concerns is the problem of worldliness. I think mm -hmm. that when I began my ministry back in 1987, the world still, and, and I mean our culture, certainly in the uh, United States, held a particular contempt for people who were same-sex attracted. Uh, it was not only disapproved of morally, uh, people viewed people who identified as gay or lesbian with a rather open contempt. And unfortunately, that contempt, which was a worldly attitude, certainly not a biblical one, it seeped into many uh, uh, Christian leaders and it, it came through in the way they expressed their position. As you know, it's one thing to express a position on something. This is unbiblical. This is a sin. It's another thing to express it with a kind of contempt you don't express for other sins that are equally serious. Well, that was a, a, a good case of the church being influenced by the world. Now, the culture has shifted, unfortunately, now, as the culture has become very gay-affirming, in too many cases, again, Christian leaders are influenced with a certain spirit of worldliness, the, the taking on either an affirming position or at least a position that minimizes the seriousness of this sin. And I think one of the gravest dangers Bible-believing churches uh, are facing is the danger of, if not rewriting the Bible to accommodate homosexuality, at least minimizing the seriousness of it and treating it as though it's a minor doctrinal difference, one that we can just agree to disagree on, but it's really no big deal. And uh, of course, biblically, we know that any form of sexual sin is extremely serious. This particular sexual sin is being celebrated as we speak. People are coming out and embracing it. The last thing we want to do in the body of Christ is literally work against the spirit of God who is striving with these people to bring them to truth. So if there is one particular thing I'm concerned about mm -hmm. uh, in worldliness, the church not being influenced by the spirit of the world. Mm. I remember watching and listening to your testimony where you went to church and this group of guys, uh, they showed godliness and just genuine love. And knowing your full story, they didn't treat you with the contempt or they didn't uh, welcome you or, or did, did not welcome you. They said, oh, you're one of us. And they said, you know what? We all deal with different sins. So you're one of us. You, you, welcome to the club, so to speak. And yeah. that spirit really helped along your journey of discovering who you are in Christ, didn't it, Joe? Well, say he, yes, this isn't rocket science, is it? <laughs> I mean, I think those wonderful guys probably could not even spell the word homosexual. They certainly didn't have any expertise on the topic, but they didn't need to. They exercised simple discipleship principles. One thing that, and I think Linda would reiterate this at Restory, we're not offering some whole newfangled approach from some complicated position we're talking about biblically based discipleship principles. How do you walk alongside people who struggle? Because, and to me, this is quite a soapbox issue. When you talk about struggling with same sex attraction or being affected by someone who struggles, you're talking about loneliness. It is a very lonely struggle because there are many people within the church who privately wrestle with these temptations and they know that their church does not approve of that sin. And the, so they mistakenly think, well, then I better keep my mouth shut because if somebody thought I was even tempted by this, they would shun me. Many parents who have kids come out to them this month, they will experience it. Christian parents will have a son or daughter come out and they'll feel like, oh dear, we better not tell anyone in the church, they'll think we failed. And so there's this conspiracy of secrecy around the issue. We are hoping to puncture that mm -hmm. and open the door to, to, to say, let's look at this and let's look at it from a biblical perspective and deal with it because goodness, the culture is sure dealing with it. Why should we shy away from it? Absolutely. And it's in the Bible. And so we do need to talk about it. And it's in the lives of our people that we love and Jesus died for. And Linda, you could also, Dr. Seiler, you could probably also agree with his testimony of people um, kind of like embracing him 
And in your testimony, there was one individual particularly did not get shocked when you reveal this secret to that person instead of being rebuked or shunned. Uh, it was a very gracious response, not a contempt that really helped you along the journey as well. You want to briefly share about that? Yeah, I was living a double life, uh, uh, terrified to come out to anybody in the 1980s because our culture was so different. And uh, finally, I just I just couldn't take it anymore. And uh, my senior year in college, I decided to confess to my campus pastor. And uh, when I shared with him my deepest, darkest secret that I'd never told anybody on the planet, I expected him to shun me, to kick me out of the group, embarrass me be horrified. And he just looked me in the eyes and said, Linda, thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I want you to know that doesn't change our opinion of you. We love you. We see mm -hmm. the hand of God on your life. We want to get you the help that you need. And I don't think I'd be here today if he didn't respond with compassion without compromising the truth of God's word. But I, I think one of the things we're doing today is we're as globally as the church of the body of Christ, we're saying that LGBTQ is somehow a different form of sin, a different category altogether. And uh, so we treat it differently, but really we all break in different ways. Some people don't struggle with their sexuality like Joe and I have, but they struggle in other ways. And yet, like Joe said, we're not offering something, some newfangled solution. We're offering biblical discipleship. We're addressing the process of progressive sanctification where God begins to uh, conform us to the image of Christ in our mind, will, and emotions. And that affects even our decisions we make and even the desires of our bodies because spirit, soul, and body are all connected. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, compassion without compromise. That is really, really important. We need to practice that every day. And I think unless we experience that through whatever situation, you know, LGBTQ issue or not, we all go through some sort of a sinful issue and we have to be mentored and corrected and taught. And so when we experience compassion without compromise, we're able to extend that to other people. I've heard somebody say, you know, love God and love your neighbors. But the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. But uh, someone corrected it, said, love your neighbors as Christ would. Because sometimes the way Christ loves others is deeper, more, uh, more significant than how we love ourselves. It, even us loving ourselves is limited. So I really love that and how they rephrase it, love others as Christ would. Um, I think, uh, Dr. Seiler, you answered my number three question because I was going to ask about how do we respond to our LGBTQ plus friends and family members who don't agree with Christian value, uh, especially those who grew up in a Christian home. Maybe you can add to this. People, like I have friends like that too. And some of my students that I pastor uh, years ago, uh, great Christian family and they love Jesus. They were in leadership team, but then they came out or came out as an advocate or you know, a, as one of the community members. And then they're just total opposite. Um, but then they start to um, kind of, showing contempt, borrowing Joe's language, contempt to the Christian community. How do you respond to that? Mm -hmm. Great question. And we're seeing a lot of that happen today because our culture has shifted so much. And because LGBTQ has become normalized, people literally believe that you're born that way and cannot change, even though there's not evidence for that scientifically. But the narrative has been repeated so many times. It, people just think that it's true. And it seems um, discompassionate and unaffirming if you, if you don't celebrate with your LGBTQ friends. And sometimes, like you were just mentioning, we elevate the second command to love our neighbor above the first command to love God with everything we've got. And when we do that and we fear people more than we fear God, then we will bow the knee to whatever this world is saying is acceptable uh, because we're afraid of being different. We're afraid of being persecuted for our faith. Um, but one of the things I think is at the root of all of this is the age old question from the Garden of Eden. Did God really say, is his design for sexuality truly one man with one woman in a lifelong covenant relationship? And I think what's happening today is people are hearing friends and family members who are telling them, I feel like I was born this way. I've tried to change and I cannot. And I need you to love me right where I'm at and let me have this 
identity and live this out with my partner or whatever. And it, it feels discompassionate to say, no, that's not the way of God. I know you feel that way, but it, you can't feel that way and you can't marry a partner and all of that. And I get that because that was my experience. I literally felt like I was born that way. Um, but we have to go back and instead of reevaluating our theology based on our experience, what some people are doing is changing their theology to match their subjective experience or to, to match the narrative of their loved one because it feels more compassionate. Mm -hmm. Instead, we need to allow the word of God to be the foundation for everything we do. And the word is my filter for my experience. And so if my experience is not lining up with the word of God, it's not God who's wrong. It's me who's off. So in my case, when I was feeling transgender desires, the world tells me today, Linda, you need to rearrange the skin on your body to match the concept of your gender identity in your mind. You feel like a man, so get a surgery, take hormones and appear as a man. But the reality, biblically speaking, is the answer is not to rearrange the skin on my body to match my fallen mind. The answer scripturally is to renew my mind to match the biological body that my creator has given me. Mm, that's really good. And biblical interpretation, I think that's really important because right. everybody has different interpretations, but we are talking about our Christian family. And if you do follow Christ, then we have a certain standard and that is a biblical worldview that we get to live by. And so very good point, uh, Dr. Seiler. Many people probably contemplate hard about breaking this news on this day and about their sexual identity to their loved ones is a scary thing, right? No, knowing fully well that that is inconsistent with the Bible and how they're brought up even sometimes. So based on your own experience, Joe, what words of wisdom do you have for those who feel strongly about their homosexual identity and plan to break the news today? Well, been there, done that. I understand, I appreciate, I will even say I respect very much the struggle the concerns and even your exasperation probably with a lot of people you've dealt with who did not seem to understand. I get all of that. There are really two questions you've got to ask yourself and please be honest in asking them. One, am I within God's will? Two, do I care? I'm not so interested in hearing, do you really feel this way? Well, yes, I believe you do. Does God still love you? Yes, I know he does. Are you saved? Well, if you've been born again, it may well be that if you are contemplating sexual sin, you are on the verge of being backslidden or severely deceived or carnal or in rebellion or prodigal. I'm not going to say you're going to hell in a handbasket. That I don't know. I will say it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I wouldn't mess with that if I were you. But the, the real question to me is not just does God love you or even are you saved as if, you know, that's all there is to it. Are you in God's will? which is another matter. That's what I had to ask myself in 1984 after a very committed season of gay activism. Yes, God loves me, blah, blah, blah. But is this, is this really what he wants for me? Or did I decide it's what I wanted and I was going to try to impose that on him and make it fit? And then secondly, if you are not in God's will, does that even matter to you? Because if you claim to belong to him, Shouldn't there be some sense of allegiance as in, well, it's not so much what can I get away with or what will I be forgiven for? But like, oh, Saul of Tarsus said it beautifully when he was knocked off his horse. Lord, what would you have me to do? Mm -hmm. That is the question, you see. And, and mm -hmm. so I would just encourage you, if you are on the verge of making that decision, and I'm glad you brought this up, Sehi, there are plenty of people in our churches who have this festering thing. They've had these feelings. They've been afraid to say that they have them. They don't know what to do. And they're doing what David said not to do, by the way. David said, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. They're starting to get onto YouTube or TikTok, and they're hearing the counsel of the ungodly. Pretty soon mm -hmm. they're going to be standing in the way of sinners, experimenting. Give them a little while. They'll be plunked down in the seat of the scornful. And they... Mm -hmm. and some of the most vociferous opponents of truth today are the people who once held it. Before you go there, save yourself a lot of time and hassle by just asking those two questions. I think that'd be a good place to start. Wow, that's really good. Instead of asking, does God love me? Because that is true. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this God's will? That's a more difficult question. And do I even care? Wow. Yeah. We have some hard questions to answer right now. 
And I also want to encourage our audience, um, pastors, ministry leaders, um, disciple makers, just know that there are people in your circle of influence that are just troubled and that are contemplating and they feel alone. You know, we talked about that, that, that loneliness and they want to maybe bring this up to you because they want to be in God's will. But just like Dr. Seiler's testimony, when they do bring that to you, please be compassionate without compromising the biblical truth. You can do both. And you saw that through their stories. Can I just ask you to uh, just be ready for that encounter? It's ready for that moment. Uh, don't be shocked and don't shun them and don't say, oh, I'm going to have to pray about it. Think about it. Just love them where they're at and listen and, and just walk with them. Can you do that? And this is very critical because this determines their next step of obedience in their journey toward Christ. So very, very excellent um, commentary and sharing your stories. By the way, if you guys are interested in hearing their full stories, which we could be here for days and talk about their own testimonies, just Google their names and say testimony. I mean, I stayed up till like one o'clock one night just watching their videos, <laughs> video after video about their stories and ministry. This is so powerful. And I love the fact that there is Dr. Seiler representing women and, and Joe representing men. There are everybody. It, it, it doesn't show favoritism to one gender. It's everybody, all age, all cultures, really. Everybody needs to take a listen if you want to be better ministers. Okay. So I have a last question for uh, Dr. Seiler. What are absolute do's and don'ts when ministers engage the LGBTQ plus members and what's the best way to respond to those who come out today with their sexual identity? We kind of talk about this. Um, we, I have some colleagues uh, who um, have their church members, like not members, maybe just attendees that are LGBTQ members. They're loving them, embracing them, but really don't know what's next and how to take them to the next level. But as they're journeying with them, what are some of the absolute do's and don'ts? I would say... We make, again, LGBTQ a separate category, separate from anything having to do with the gospel. And it's not a separate category. The greatest need of somebody who experiences attractions to the same sex or an alternative sexual identity, transgender, and they announce it to the world, their greatest problem is not their sexuality. Their greatest problem is they are not connected and submitted to their creator. And we need to make that the central issue, connecting people to Jesus Christ. When somebody gets connected to the Lord and they surrender their lives to him, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of them. And he begins to deal with the issues of our lives at the, the time and the pace that we're able to respond and handle. I think sometimes we try to, like Joyce Mary says, try to be Holy Spirit Junior <laughs> and help people along. And we look at the issues in people's lives that they're struggling with and say, you need to fix that, fix that, fix that, fix that. And you know what? That's not the way Jesus responded to you and me when we came to him. He met us in the middle of our mess. We were messy and we're still messy <laughs> as his kids. But he meets us in the middle of his, our mess. He's patient with us. He doesn't. He's not expecting change overnight. Um, he's, he's not expecting us to clean up our act in order to come to him. It's about saying, I'm, I'm a sinner and I'm in the middle of my mess and there's nothing I could ever do to save myself. Are you still willing to meet me in the middle of this? And I, I just receive your free gift of salvation and relationship with you, not because I've earned it or I even deserve it, but simply because you're offering. And that needs to be our heart toward the LGBTQ community is not we got to force you to change. And, and it's not about their sexuality at all. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about the gospel. It's no different than any other sin issue. When I was on campus uh, working at Purdue University, directing Chi Alpha there, we would have students into binge drinking and sleeping with their boyfriend and girlfriend before they marry and swearing and cheating on tests and all of that. And we didn't say, hey, you need to stop this behavior before you can receive the gospel. No, we knew that when they receive the gospel and they surrender to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will begin to transform them from the inside out. And so I think we need to keep that in mind with the LGBTQ community and our friends that are adopting and, and coming out with these alternative identities. And then the second thing I would say is this. Joe mentioned just the loneliness that goes with that. The other thing I discovered is there tends to be a, a, a deep wound of rejection uh, that I think all of us can relate to rejection, but for those who experience um, insecurity with their gender identity and attractions to the same sex, 
I have found in my own personal experience, in my research and in my practical experience helping other people, there is usually a deep wound of rejection, which seems to be what feeds the whole attitude behind LGBTQ pride. You must accept us. We will force you to accept us. We will intimidate you into accepting us. And it's it's a carnal means of looking to created things, created people to, to soothe that wound of rejection rather than having that met through our creator. And so I think we need to be sensitive to that, that there can be deep wounds of rejection. I'm not saying it's there all the time, but many times with our LGBTQ friends, they wouldn't admit it to you, but there can be deep wounds of rejection, maybe because they didn't fit in when they were growing up. They didn't fit the typical gender stereotype of being a man's man or a feminine woman, or they had some adverse family dynamics growing up that were really painful and contributed to some of their thinking that maybe it's not safe to be a woman or it's, it's not good to be a man. Uh, sometimes there's child sexual abuse and just some deeply painful experiences that happened in the past that can affect our view of our own sexuality and just men and women in general. And we just need to be aware of that, that usually behind those people adopting those identity and coming out and proud, they appear confident and secure and happy, but underneath the veneer, many times there are some deep wounds of rejection and we need to love them in the middle of their mess the same way Christ has loved us. Very good. I think we complicate the gospel sometimes. Really, when it comes down to it, is restoring our relationship between God and us, all broken humanity, whatever the sin is. And so thank you for just highlighting that over and over in our brief conversation. Joe and Dr. Seiler, thank you so much for our conversation. Is there any um, social handles or contact for ministers who really feel helpless uh, Restory was one of the ministry resources you shared. Uh, Joe, you might have some other things, or maybe people um, who don't have the strong relationship with their pastors, but they do want to reach out uh, and confess and confide in somebody. Uh, what are some uh, options for them? Could you kind of drop us some um, options? Well, certainly Restory Ministries, if you contact our website, we are there both for people who are personally struggling and afraid to speak up and we're certainly there for pastors and ministry leaders and concerned Christians who want to minister to them. One thing I think Linda and I would, would say huge amens to is the real changes that need to happen, happen in the context of the local congregation. It's in the church, you see? And this is what God ordained, that members of the body of Christ build each other up. We want to be there to help pastors, to walk alongside pastors who are wanting to say, yeah, we want to roll up our sleeves and deal with this you know, partner with us. And we want to partner with the people who struggle and we want to see it happen within the church because we do believe parachurch is very important, but it's a supplement to the main meal. The main meal is the church, the congregation. Mm -hmm. And this is why Restory is here. We want to build up the church. So if they will contact, whether it's the individual struggle or the pastor, I really feel they'll get the resourcing that they need. That's great. Yeah, we can't wait uh, to partner with you and support you and the community, really. This ministry is so timely. Thank you so much for boldly sharing your story for the cause of Christ and for the salvation of all. We love you guys. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Wow, guys, I am walking away with wealth of wisdom. I love my friends that are part of the LGBTQ plus community. I just want to be a better learner, better listener, and better compassionate minister who does not compromise because you know, right, it, this is right. I, my calling is to first honor God and love him and love others like Christ does. Well, so much wisdom. Um, I know that there is still more because right now we're going to pass it but pass the mic to Crystal because she has a, minis a ministry leadership minute to share with you to continue to empower you and equip you in your leadership journey. We'll join us back next time and God bless you. Hello, Network of Women Ministers, friends and family. It's so good to see you again as we're just learning together. So something I've thought about recently is an instant that happened a long time ago when I was first married. My husband had one of those really huge mustaches that I guess was popular back then. But after we got married, I was like, please, please shave the mustache. 
So one day, I guess we were camping, we were by ourselves and he decided this was the day he was going to surprise me and shave the mustache. But to his chagrin, he shaved it and came to show me and I didn't notice. Like he kept looking at me and be like, hey, Crystal, do you notice anything different? You know, uh, anything kind of gave me a kiss and I was like, oh yeah, good to, yeah, it's a great day. It's a great day. This is the day the Lord has made anything different. So we, he kind of went through this until finally he couldn't take it anymore. And he was like, Crystal, I shaved my mustache and you didn't notice. And all of a sudden it was the only thing I noticed was he shaved his nuts mustache. So this is kind of a piece of my personality that's a little bit embarrassing. Like if you dye your hair purple and come say hi to me, I may not notice it. There is something wrong with me. But I'll tell you on the flip side, one of my top strengths is I am a maximizer. I might not see in the natural, but God has given me eyes as an encourager that I often can see in the emotional and spiritual realm things inside of people before they even see it in themselves. And I do think that that's not a personality trait. It's something that the Lord is calling all of us do. Remember, he asked us that we would all prophesy. And, and oftentimes, the that encouragement moves into the prophetic. You know what I mean? You start with wow, I can see something great in you. Man, I saw when you got up and did that, that the Lord began to move on you in a special way. And then from that, we feel like the Holy Spirit puts wings on it, right? All of you have probably been in this situation where you move from an encourager to the point where you feel the Holy Spirit put weight to your encouragement and it becomes a prophetic word in people's, in people's ears and their hearts. My good friend, Christus, Smith recently said this. She said, you know, as we're working, she's a great prophet among us. And she said, you know, as we're working with people, it's easy to see their sin. It's harder to see the gold underneath. And I do believe that as God is calling us up as ministers, he's calling us up to see, to see in the flesh and encouragement, but then to allow that to be a gateway into the prophetic. Because do you know what this generation needs? They don't need to necessarily be seen by us. But when the word becomes prophetic, they are all of a sudden then what? Seen by God. And there is nothing more healing than to be seen by God. So as we wrap up this Learn Together episode, open your heart to encouraging others. You may not have that prophetic or even that gift at this point, but hunger it greatly because the world is ready for people open to the prophetic to give those gifts to a world that's hurting. Amen. May God bless you today. May he cause you to be fruitful in every area of your life. Let's go live out our calling.